you want to clap, let's clap. Thank you, Mr. Don. Uh, the wordings of that song is that God will help us to proclaim his honor, his glory, his name throughout the world. And for me, that is a very important prayer. And it is the way God wants us to live as disciples of Christ, that we live for him, and anything we do, we know that we are doing it for God's glory. And we live in the community, in the society, in our workplace, in marketplace, in the schools, anywhere we find ourselves, you know, as people who are disciples of Christ and who live for God's heart. My prayer is that that will be our decision and that will be uh, our lifestyle every day. So you're welcome to Main Street, United Methodist Church, and I would like us to bow our heads as we pray together. Precious Father, we thank you so much for your grace. We thank you for your love. We thank you, O oh God, for your presence that is here even before we got here. We thank you, Lord, because we know that where two or three are gathered together in your name, there you are in their midst, and you are there to grant unto them that which they request. Thank you, Lord, because this worship is only unto you and through it lord you're going to meet us at the very point of our needs we thank you and we say spirit of the living god take your place in this space today we thank you father we honor you and may we live for you in jesus precious name i pray and the church say amen, amen. We say the prayer of invocation together. Almighty God, to you all desires are known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please stand as we sing together.
I think we missed something last Sunday. That was uh, uh, the birthday song for those who were born in the month of uh, September. Right? We missed it. Maybe because we just came back. So, if you were born in the month of September, please remain standing. If you gave birth in the month of September, please stand. Right? Let's sing. Congratulate you. God bless you. Father, I pray for these ones that were born in the month of September. I pray, O oh God, that you will continue to pilot their steps and may they continue to live for you. And Lord, may they live to fulfill the numbers of your days. In Jesus' precious name, I pray. Amen. Uh, I want to say, for me, that song we sang this morning, that first song, is powerful. It's very powerful. I've always loved the song, and you can go back to it and read the wordings yourself. And if you want to enjoy the tune again, you either go on Google to listen to it and sing it along with any choir you know, that has put it up there, or you ask Mr. Don to come back to church to play it for you. Uh, uh, it's very prophetic. Uh, the kingdom of God will reign forever. The devil's uh, destination is already defined. He knows that the hand is near for him, and we will not fear him or any of his cohorts. Uh, we are happy to uh, welcome Mrs. K back and uh, to lead us in that song today. God bless you. I want to say once again, good morning to everybody. And if you are here worshiping with us for the first time, uh, we would like to know you more. And if you can use the notification card that is at the back of the pew uh, that is in front of you to communicate with us, we will really appreciate it. We'd like to know you, we'd like to pray with you, and if there is any way we can also help, we'd like to uh, do that. We live as a church to be empowered when we come together uh, within the confines of this building, but we go out there to manifest God's glory and make difference in our community. And if you are worshiping online for the first time, we'd like to know you also, and if you can use the phone number or the email address uh, where you are worshiping, either on our website or on our Facebook page to communicate with us, we we'll also appreciate it uh, so much. I would like to call your attention to a few things uh, in the news. Uh, the first thing is that, please, we really need uh, your current address. If you are a member of this church, we need your current address, contact address, we need your email address and functional phone numbers. 
uh, please send that to uh, our office anytime, or you can just write it in the paper and give it to me after this service. And we'll really appreciate it. If you are sending it as email to us, to our office, uh, please uh, put in the subject line uh, contact address. Okay? We we'll really appreciate it if you can get that in as soon as possible. The chapel of praise uh, had a problem with their building, and the building is at the verge of collapse, and they, they had to move out of the place uh, very quickly, and uh, they sought for our help. Uh, they have found a place where they are going to be worshiping on Sunday morning, and that will be in the fire, old firehouse, um, but for their Sunday evening meetings, they uh, reached out to us, and we have uh, obliged them uh, because we are one in Christ. So they will be using uh, the fellowship hall B beginning from September 19 through the end of November. And in case you come in here and you are using the fellowship hall A, uh, just make sure uh, the divider uh, door is always closed. And um, uh, don't be surprised if you see them. And they will not disturb anyone. We have talked to them. Uh, this is one thing I believe we can do for one another at this time. And um, so they will be there from 5.30 to about 7.30 or 8 p.m. on Sundays, beginning from next Sunday. Um, we encourage us to please uh, pick our T-shirts at the back. If yours has arrived, please pick it so that we can display more T-shirts uh, at the back there. And we also encourage us to look forward to when we are going to all wear our T-shirts. The Miami County Prayer Walk is getting close to us again. Last year, some of us were there and we took a walk around this city. Uh, again, we're going to do that on the 26th of this month. Uh, we encourage you to please uh, prepare yourself for it. For me, I would love to see many more Main Street members uh, during the rally. And God bless us as we do so in Jesus' name. Amen. Focus on the children. Ready? Children, please come forward. As they are getting ready, if you have not picked this um, paper, which was distributed last week, please uh, uh, endeavor to please pick uh, two copies for your family and drop one on your seat or in the offering plate. Thank you. I have some goodies in here if any of the older children want to make an appearance up here. Sawyer? <laughs> we may need your help on some of this anyway. Do any of you know what disobey means? I figured you probably did. Anybody? Oh, we all know disobey. I don't know if that's good or bad. AJ, what does disobey mean? You don't listen, correct? You're not obeying someone, correct? Sawyer? Okay, same thing, not listening. Actually, the definition in the Bible is you fail to obey rules, commands, or someone in authority. So who is it that we disobey? I know I'll start. I always have to use a golf ball as a prop, but I remember my mom and dad telling me when I was a child, don't, don't hit too many golf balls around the house, and I do remember hitting one right through a window one time. So that was disobeying my parents. Is there any time you can remember where you disobeyed someone? So Eric, do you want to give an example, or you'd rather just keep it secret? He's going to keep it secret. What about your teachers? 
If you don't do your homework or listen or talk in class, is that disobeying? Okay, now we can get one. Sawyer says he talks in class sometimes. I can't imagine that. Oh, talks in class. <laughs> you talk in class too? Um, what about your brothers and sisters? Like if, AJ, I bet there have been times where your sisters have been left in charge of you. Does that work out good or do you disobey that doesn't work out good? <laughs> I figured. <laughs> no. <laughs> Mom's back there saying no. Um, well, the good thing ab about it, if we do disobey all of those examples that I gave, all of those people are still going to care about you and love you even though you've disobeyed them, right? So, so that's good. When Mr. Miles reads the Old Testament lesson today, he's going to talk about Adam and Eve. So let's, let's talk about Adam and Eve and, and disobeying. God had placed Adam and Eve in a special garden that was very beautiful. In it were fish, animals, and lovely plants and trees. There also was plenty of food to eat. Adam and Eve worked every day taking care of that garden, and they talked to, to God each day as well. God only had one rule for Adam and Eve. Does anybody remember what that one rule was? Don't eat from the one tree that was right in the center of the garden. Now, when I was your age and growing up, it was always referred to as an apple tree. Now, sometimes it just says fruit, but, but it was a fruit tree, and it was right in the middle of the garden. So that would be like you getting placed in Disney World, and God said you can do anything you want in Disney World, stay as long as you want, but you can't ride It's a Small World. And you walk by It's a Small World every day, every day, every day, and then all of a sudden, you... <laughs> <laughs> it's a small world's my favorite ride. But they walk by that tree every day, and sooner or later, what, what happened? How, why did they finally take a bite of the fruit? Did somebody, AJ, the snake, that's awesome that you know that story. They were tempted by Satan in the form of the snake, and Adam and Eve ate the fruit. So the first thing that they did, and we do this sometimes when we disobey, they were afraid and they ran and hid. When I hit the golf ball through the window, there was, uh, that was a hard one to hide from, but I sure wish I could have run off and hid. So that's what Adam and Eve did, but God found them, and, and God spoke to them. And, and Adam said, I am hiding because I am afraid. God was sad that Adam and Eve have disobeyed his rule. God did not stop loving and caring for Adam and Eve. God made clothes for them. He loved Adam and Eve even though they had disobeyed him. God loves us too when we disobey him. We don't need to try and hide but God, but to, from God, but we should admit to him whenever we've done wrong or disobeyed him. Sometimes that's hard to do. Sometimes you can just say it to yourself. Sometimes you can say it in prayer. But go ahead and admit, admit when, when you've done something. And this is... This is the, the most important thing to remember today is that although God gives us many good things, just like he gave Adam and Eve a beautiful garden, disobedience can mess things up. So just remember that. And also, like I said, remember that, that God always will love you. Now for the goodies. Um, the first thing, see some of them are going to be upset they didn't. I'm going to give each one of you, since it's close to Halloween, look at these cool little fingers. You got one of these little fingers. Go ahead. That's yours, AJ. And this will remind you all the way through Halloween when your little fingers try to start doing something that's going to disobey somebody. Uh-uh. Just remember that little thing. Then, since you all are smart enough not to disobey, there's a smarty for you. See? You two should have been up here. Now, who likes Reese's or Hershey's? You like Reese's? Hershey's? Reese's? Now, don't disobey your parents and eat this. Okay, take one to Esther. Do you have brothers and sisters here with you? Okay, you want to have a Kit Kat? Take those to your sisters. Okay, let's say a quick prayer, and then, then we'll turn it over to Reverend Samuel. Ready? Dear God, we are very sorry when we disobey you. 
but thank you very much for still loving and caring for us. Amen. The Old Testament lesson today comes to us from Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 10. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees of the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. The psalm today is Psalm 91, verses 1 to 8. Please read with me responsively. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the foul snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. His fruitfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night nor the arrow that flies by day nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. Our New Testament lesson comes to us from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 18 to 23, and chapter 2, verses 4 to 6. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope in which he called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and domination, and every name that is involved, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Please stand as we affirm what we believe about our God in the words of the Apostles' Creed. 
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father. And we come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated as we continue to pray. Precious Father, eternal God, ancient of days, the God that was, the God that is, the God that continues to be forever. We praise you, we honor you, we adore you. We proclaim your sovereignty over all. We say today, Father, that there is none like you. We lift you high, O oh God, in our hearts. And Lord Almighty, the fruit of our lips praise you today because we have found no one that is like you. And so today we thank you for our going out, our coming in. We thank you for our safety. We thank you, Lord, for the breath that we breathe in. We thank you, God, for every part of us. We thank you, Father, for your grace upon us. We thank you, Lord Almighty, for your protection over us. We thank you for answers to our prayers. We thank you, Lord Almighty, even for the things that we do not understand, things that you do for us things that you do and we have not seen and we do not even know, we do not take cognizance of them. Lord, this morning we want to say thank you. We know we can never outpress you. And Father, we just come this morning to say we are grateful to you for the numerous uh, graces that we continue to receive. We say thank you. Thank you, Lord, for this land. Thank you, Lord Almighty, for this country. Thank you, Lord Almighty, for every family that is here gathered and worshiping online. Thank you, Lord, for all our extended family members, where they are. We give you praise. We give you glory. Father, for what you have prepared to do in our lives, even in this new week, we want to say thank you because we know that you have plans for us. And your word says to us that your plans for us are of welfare. They are to bring us to that future that you so much want us to enter into. Thank you, Father, because we can always trust you. At this time, I want to invite you, I want to invite anyone here who knows somebody or a member of a family who lost their loved ones in the wicked ever event of 9-11. I invite you to just mention their names aloud or the name of the family and I will pray from here.
Father, we want to say thank you so much. Thank you, Lord, because we believe that 20 years you have been with this nation. The enemy wanted it for total evil, total destruction. And Lord, as this country remember 9-11 yesterday, we know there are many families that are grieving, many families that remember their loved ones. Even if none of us here, Lord, uh, was directly imparted by it, we pray for such families today, Father, that you will please bring them your comfort that they so much need, your hope that they so much desire. We pray, Father, Lord Almighty, that you, God, who is able to sustain nations, we continue to sustain this country. And the Lord, we pray that all wicked ones, according to your word that we read in the psalm today, we will see their punishment. Lord, we pray this morning that you, God Almighty, who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above what we could think or imagine, we help this nation, the leadership of this nation, Lord, to continue to draw close to you and hand over the governance of this nation to you. Father, as all over the world, we celebrate grandparents and what they are to us. I pray for all the grandparents in here, in our church, in this land. I pray that in the name of Jesus, may the blessings of the Lord rest upon you. I pray that the good things that God has brought into your life that you see on daily basis and give you joy, we continue to multiply. I pray for you, grandfathers, grandmothers, that the Lord Almighty will preserve you, we pray and rebuke sickness for your sake. I pray that in the name of Jesus, you will continue to derive joy over your children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Lord, we thank you because we believe that these are many more you will do for us. Before you, O oh God, today I lift up all the people that we prayed for on this list. I ask, Lord, that you who know their needs will please, Lord, step into their situations and glorify your name. You can do it, and we believe you, and we know you are at work. Thank you, blessed Father. To you alone be all the glory, praises, honor, and adoration. We pray all these in your name, in Jesus' name, and the church say, Amen. The Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is Nancy.
Thank you. God bless you. I invite you to please find the sermon outline um, just in case you want to follow as I preach this sermon. Today is the fifth Sunday since I began this series. And today is the second Sunday since I started the second session in the series, which is fear, the enemy of great future. Fear not. Let us pray. Eternal Father, your word is yea and amen. I pray that you will speak through me today to the glory and honor of your name. Give unto every one of us understanding of your mind. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Last Sunday, I said that fear connotes a sense of terror. It is slavish, and we must do everything as God's children to avoid it and conquer it. We also saw that God has made over 365 provisions commands when he said, fear not. And all these are in the Bible. And what this means is that God has taken care of every fear that we may come across, that the devil may want to throw at us each day of our lives. I concluded the sermon last Sunday by saying that even if you have your fears, you are not alone. Peter was also afraid 
even when he saw Jesus Christ standing before him, he considered the wind, and he started sinking, but he cried out to God, and he was heard. So fear did not come into existence or into human space without a reason. And it has been tormenting a lot of people. A lot of people live in it and died in it. In fact, many people died because of fear. So what are the causes of fear? There are many causes of fear, but for time, I'm going to talk about two. The first thing is sin. Sin is the reason for fear. Fear gained entrance into the hearts of Adam and Eve as a result of sin. And sin entered the human race as a result of disobedience. We listened to it in the focus on the children this morning. And I know we all know the story, but listen to what Adam himself said. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. That was the first time, the first mention of the word fear in the Bible. And God at that time did not say to Adam, fear not. He asked him a question, who told you, you are naked? Now God is going back to something that he knows that Adam has done, and that is sin. He knew that the man has done what he asked him not to do because God gave the instruction to the man directly. And he, he had the responsibility to say to the woman, no, don't let us do it. This is what God said. So Adam heard the sound of God's footstep talking humanly, coming to fellowship with him and his wife, as God will always do. But the man hid himself, and he said to God, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I hid myself because I'm afraid. When the man had committed the sin that ought to not have been committed, fear came in. And he wasn't the only person that that happened to. It happened to Cain. When Cain sinned against God, when he killed his brother, and God pronounced his judgment, he became afraid. He said, anyone that sees me will kill me. Moses killed an Egyptian and he too became afraid. In Exodus chapter 2 verses 12 and 14b, the Bible says, after looking in all directions to make sure no one was watching, Moses killed the Egyptian and healed the body in the sand. Then Moses was afraid. Then Moses was afraid. The first thing that happened was sin. The second thing that followed is fear. He looked in all directions. No one was coming. And you don't have to commit sin where people will see you before you become afraid. It is just automatic, except your heart your conscience is already seared. 
except the enemy, the devil has so much taken it and use it. But it is just automatic that when we sin, fear comes in. So fear is a product of sin. Sin is evil. Sin brings evil. In all ramifications, sin is evil that leads to more evil if it is not judged. And I tell you today, when a sin is committed, it opens the door of our heart to fear. It opens the door of our heart to many things that we do not expect. Unfortunately, sin, its consequences, and the fear it brings does not only affect the perpetrators of the sin. It also affects people around. It affects those who hear it. The fear that is going to generate is not only going to affect the person that committed the sin, it's also going to create fear in the heart of anyone that hears it. When people hear that someone has done something so bad, something that is evil, they are going to become afraid somehow. When Ananias and Sapphira sinned and they dropped dead right there, the Bible says that great fear grip those who heard it. Great fear grip the church. Because the person that did it is not only going to be affected. And such is the September 11 attack. The deadliest terrorist act in world Israel. A singular event in which about 3,000 people were killed. And no doubt, those who saw it, those who saw what happened, those who heard about it, children that were conceived in the womb but came to know that their father died or their brother died in that incident, I believe that fear somehow we grip them. Even to today, when we watch the movie, which, I mean the, the, the video, we see what happened. Fear grips our hearts. Just because of the evil that some people, some people who are in form of animal, did. It creates fear. But you know what? It also leaves a lot of questions in the heart of people. Sin, when it comes in, it doesn't only throw fear at us, it also throws bewilderment. It throws a lot of questions at us. Why this? Why will someone think of this in life? And the truth is, as long as the earth remains, that incident is going to be forever remembered. But you know what? I speak to you today as a beloved congregation, and I speak to Americans today. Fear not. That is what Jesus is saying. Fear not. Fear not those who can kill the body, but have no power over the soul. Fear not. Fear not those who hate what is good and godly. Fear not those who believe that anything that is Western is evil and is ungodly and they must reject it. Fear not those who believe that when a nation is rising, they must look for a way to bring it down. Fear not those
and it is a warning, a warning that yes, something is coming. With all kinds of, you know, people, with all kinds of things that are happening, all kinds of entries here and there. But I want you to know one thing, the word of God remains sure. The word of God is alive, is quick. And what it says is that, be not afraid. Be not afraid. There is a reason why God made this series to come at this time. He's saying to everyone here, fear not. I would have loved to stop here, but let me talk about the second one today. There is hope. There is hope. If sin is one cause of fear, the second cause of fear is ignorance. Ignorance. Lack of knowledge. Lack of information. Ignorance is deadly, whereas automatic, authentic, sorry, authentic information is transformative. Ignorance is deadly, but authentic information is transformative. It is unfortunate that thousands of God's children are perpetually tormented by the spirit of fear because of ignorance, because of things that we do not know. And this is what the enemy uses as an advantage to torment us from time to time when he knows that we do not understand certain things that the word of God has fully spelled out to us. In Hosea chapter 4 verse 6, God says, my people are destroyed. My people are being destroyed for lack of knowledge, lack of information. The information is there for them. It's in this world, but they will not read it. He says, my people perish. They have been destroyed for lack of knowledge. And I tell you today, if you are not aware of certain things, there is nothing you can do about it. There is just nothing you can do about it. But when you are aware, when you are well informed, the story is going to be the opposite. If a man lives in abject poverty, suddenly discovers that truly his parents left behind fortune for him, he's not going to continue to live in abject poverty, except something is wrong. Except the guy is insane. But if he's aware that he had fortune left, by the parents, for him, things are going to change. His thinking is going to change. His way of behavior is going to change. His taste is going to change. Everything about him, his disposition, everything will change. Everything will change. Information is very important. But what are we ignorant of? The first thing we are ignorant of sometimes is the devil's prefold mission. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10, that the devil comes, the enemy comes, but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Those are the three things that the devil is always targeting. It has never changed. The enemy may change his strategies of attack, but he has never changed his mission. He comes in into somebody's life to steal their joy to steal their hope and aspiration. He comes into a family to steal their unity. He comes into a nation to take away their pride and their integrity, their pursuit in life. That is what the enemy is always after. He comes to steal what is available, and he comes to kill what is aligned. He comes to destroy what we think we want to make use of in the future. That is the mission of the devil. And all Many times, we forget 
that the devil has a mission. His mission revolves around these threefold. To kill, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. For instance, when the enemy approached Eve in the Garden of Eden, he discussed with her in a friendly, subtle, but deceptive way with the aim to steal their joy and fellowship with God. And he succeeded. He went there to kill them physically, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 to 21. He went there to kill them spiritually, according to Genesis chapter 3, verse 23. He went there to destroy them in hell, according to Revelation chapter 20, verses 14 and 15. So the first thing we are ignorant of is the devil's threefold mission. When something is working well in your home, when something is working well in your life and suddenly you begin to see the opposite, you begin to see fear come into your life, you begin to see something that should not be there, you have done everything. Please know it, don't take this for granted. Know that the enemy is at war. Not everything, and I want to say categorically here today, not everything is psychological. Not everything. Unfortunately, quite a number of times when something happens to our children, something happens to our spouses, something happens to our sons, our daughters, or our parents, we take everything to the doctor. Go to doctors, I go to doctors, my family go to doctors. But let me tell you, are you a child of God? Somebody scream from, from sleep. They scream from sleep. You think that guy, that your child should go to doctor? What has the doctor got to do with that? You are a child of the living God. Stand your ground at that time and rebuke anything. Pray for your child. If you, you don't have to shout. You don't have to pray the way Reverend Sam is going to pray it. All you need is simple faith. And I'm going to be talking about this next Sunday. How do we deal with fear? How do we deal with what the enemy brings into our lives that are unwanted? But for now, let me give us the second thing that we are ignorant of. We are also ignorant of our placement and our status in God. The conversion of our souls automatically translates us from being just God's creatures to God's children. And I want to say that again. When you are born again, you cease to be ordinary or just God's creature. You are God's creature and God's child. You are a child of the living God. And that is what the Bible says. The Bible says that he that is born of the Spirit is of the Spirit. He that is born of the Spirit is of the Spirit. We are God's children by adoption. We are. We have a place. We have a status in him. We are redeemed by God through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and our acceptance of his offer of grace to us. If you are born again, this work of redemption shows the great difference between you and unbelievers. It places you and I, who are the redeemed of God, on a higher realm of oppression. It places us on a higher realm of oppression. And I want to read the New Testament that was read to us Earlier on, I want to read a portion of it again for us. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19 to 23. And it says, that power, that is the power that raised Jesus from the dead, the power by which God called everything to be. It says, that power is the same as the mighty strength God exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rules 
and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under Jesus' feet, appointed him to be head of everything. For, for who? For who? For the church. That is what is in that sermon outline that you have there. For the church. Jesus is seated in the higher realm for you and I. And he didn't stop there. See what he did in chapter 2, verse 4. The Bible says, but because of his great love for us, praise God, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realm in Christ Jesus. Praise God. He said, we were here before. This is where, see my left hand here? This is where the principalities, dominions and powers, rulers, wicked spirits, this is where they are. But Christ is here. And when he has been seated here, once you become born again, the Bible says that Christ brings us up to sit here with him in higher realm. I tell you, that is what he did for us. You are in a place that is beyond this earth. If you are born again, if you are in Christ, you need not to be afraid of those who can kill the body or what can kill the body but cannot take away your soul. If you are born again, don't be afraid of that terror. Don't be afraid of that brag from someone that you are going to be dead in the next 24 hours. Don't be afraid of that sickness. Fear not that thing. Fear not the road, because there is someone that is inside of you. The Bible says that he that lives inside of us is greater than he that lives in the world. You are not just your name. You are not just who you are. We are placed up here. And the person that is seated here is the one that should deal with the person that is here not the person that is here dealing with the one here. No. We are seated with him in heavenly places. Positionally, that is what he has done. Practically, we are here as human beings walking around here. Don't be afraid. Mary Magdalene was afraid. She lived all her life at a particular time, in fear. And her name changed. They changed her name to something else. They took away the name, the real name, and they began to call her the name of someone who is possessed by the devil, by demons. But we're going to see something in a video, a very short clip, uh, in a moment. As Jesus called her name, her real name, he also knows your name. He knows you by name. He knows your name. He knows your thoughts. He knows everything about you. I repeat it. You are more than who you think you are. If you are born again, there is a power that is at work in you. It is the power of the living God. I stand here before you as someone who experienced it, as someone who lives by it every day, and I know that it is not the enemy that is going to kill me. It is not something that kills people that is going to kill me. But I know that I am in Christ, and he is in me. And I need not to be afraid of what the world is afraid of. Let's see the clip. Listen to what Jesus said. I don't know what else I can do to help you. Give me that. Lots of it. That's not going to solve your problems. It's meant to distract from No them. more preaching. Just give it to me. Lilith, please listen to what I'm saying.
said, leave me. That is Jesus. It's not for you. Don't touch me. Oh. Lily. Lily. Lily, are you okay? I... I have to go. Leave me alone. Her father had called her that name before. Now Jesus called Mary her name. of Magdala. Who are you? I didn't know my name. Thus says the Lord who created you. And he who formed you. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. As the world has fear, giving you another name. It is time to listen to Jesus. It is time to hear the word, fear not. Fear not. Fear not tomorrow. Fear not to take step. Fear not. Fear not. That is what Jesus says. You know, Mary recognized that quote from the Bible, from Isaiah, that Jesus quoted to her because her parents, her father, when she was young, her father was repeating that passage to her, was reading it to her from time to time. And that was why she was shocked that first someone called her the name she was used to. And two, someone quoted the passage her late father had read to her several times. Parents, what do you read to your children? Can they hear God's word from you? Please stand, everybody. I want us to pray a prayer. I want us to pray a prayer today. And it is from Psalm 91, but I twisted it, I changed it. It is still the same prayer. It's a confession I want us to make this morning. And please, let's have the psalm, the prayer. I want us to pray it confidently because I dwell in the shelter of the Most High. I will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely God will save me from the fouler snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover me and my family with His feathers, and under His wings, we will find refuge. His faithfulness will be our shield and rampart. We will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, 
nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at our side, ten thousand at our right hand, but it will not come near us. We will only observe with our eyes and see the punishment of the wicked, because we say the Lord is our refuge, and we make the Most High our dwelling. No harm will overtake us. No disaster will come near our house. In Jesus' name, and the church say, Amen. Amen. Father, thank you. Thank you. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Um, can we please bring the offering? I wouldn't want you to stand. I know we should see the doxology, but please just bring it. I will just bless it, and then I will say the benediction. Precious Father, we are grateful to you for this blessing. And out of the much you've given us, we brought this token. We pray that you will bless and sanctify it. May it be used for the furtherance of your work here on earth. Bless everyone who has brought this and bless the work that we do, O Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. I pray for you all as you go forth into the world. May the Lord Almighty go before you and go with you. May the Lord Almighty order your steps in all that you do and anywhere you go this new week. I pray that the Lord will lift up the light of his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. Peace in the morning, peace in the afternoon, peace in the evening. Peace all the days of your life. May you come back here with testimonies of his goodness, and may his protection be all around you and your family, now and forevermore. And the church say, Amen. Please turn as we sing the closing song. Presence. 